Good morning, church. It is good to see everybody this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, whether you're here in Gillsburg or watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or via USB drive, we welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church, and we're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. If you're here this morning visiting with us and you're looking for a new church, uh, please grab one of, us at, one of us at the end of the service, and we'll be glad to tell you about our midweek activities and the things that we have available for you and your children or grandchildren. If you're just here visiting loved ones or a family member, we're so glad that you're here. We want you to know you're welcome uh, here at any time as well. So a few announcements this morning before we turn it over to Brother Doug. I want to remind everyone about our midweek activities on Wednesday night, uh, food and fellowships at 530. And then at 6 o'clock, our kids break out for their activities and, and our adults have their prayer service. And then at 630, choir practice begins. So 530 supper. 6 o'clock we break out into our prayer service and children's organizations, and then 6.30 our choir practice. Also today, today at 5 o'clock, the Open Circle Sunday School class is having a gathering at Mr. Rodney and Miss Diane Dykes' home that begins at 5 o'clock. So join us for food, fellowship, and fun if you're a part of that new Open Circle Sunday School class. We'll be there at their home at 5 o'clock. Remember, the youth are selling pecans. So if you want to buy pecans, the youth are selling those. They have their little sign-up sheets to put your name and information down. Uh, we're selling one pound at $9 and uh, three pounds at $27. And those orders are due on November the 9th. So we just got a couple weeks left to get those orders due, uh, get those orders in. The reason we need them by November the 9th is to make sure you have your pecans uh, by Thanksgiving. Okay, so if you'd like some pecans, please see a youth and get those ordered. Also, remember the 21 days of praying for America, October the 19th through November the 8th. Uh, Dr. Vick is, is sending out a, a mass email uh, every day. You should be getting that email reminding you uh, of, the, of those days of praying for America. Uh, we've had a couple come back, so a couple email addresses telling us their inbox is full or maybe we have the wrong address that have come, are coming back. So if you're not getting that email, uh, please see Ms. Sherry or Ms. Sonia and we'll get that email uh, corrected. If you're not on that email list and you want to be, I will be glad to add you to that. So also let Ms. Sherry and Ms. Sonia know. We just want to make sure we have the right email addresses and that everyone's getting that email uh, each day. October the 30th, our trunk or treat. Uh, that begins at 5 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, we'll have fellowship and refreshments. Uh, the ladies asked me to announce about the cake walk. We're doing a cake walk for that, so we need people to bring cakes or purchase cakes, or if you can't uh, purchase one, maybe donate a little money so that we can uh, go buy a cake. So cookies, brownies, anything. Cookies, brownies, anything, just any, any type of sweet dessert for the cake walk uh, on October the 30th for our trunk or treat. Also want to remind everyone we're getting down to the end of October. Your Sunday school classes should be collecting items for Samaritan Purse shoe boxes. Uh, and we'll finish that up at the end of October. Uh, so please, if you're a part of that Sunday, your Sunday school class, you know what item uh, you need to bring. Please get those in here in the next week or so, and uh, we can get, get all those. Our children are going to put all the Samaritan Purse shoe boxes together for us as we're shooting to hit our goal of 100. You can still get a box, a shoe box for yourself, and do that yourself as well. You can still do it online as well. Uh, but the kids have been uh, doing this ever since VBS, Vacation Bible School, collecting these items. And uh, so we're trying to finish strong here by getting our Sunday school classes to help us. So remember Samaritan Purse shoe boxes. And then on November the 6th, Sunday, November the 6th at 345, uh, the youth will leave here to go to Tylertown Baptist Church uh, to experience the Judgment House. So November the 6th, 345, we will leave here to go to Tylertown Baptist Church for Judgment House, and then you'll have uh, dinner there at uh, the Johnson's home, okay? Uh, so if you are a youth and you want to be a part of that, please put that on your calendar as you head to the Judgment House. Uh, just because I know many of you, you may want to repent before you go to the Judgment House. Just saying. You may want to repent before you go to the Judgment House. Any other announcements this morning that I need to make? Before I turn it over to Brother Doug. If not, it's good to see everyone again this morning. We welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. And Brother Doug, it's all yours. 
Well, good morning. Scripture says, let the heavens be glad and earth rejoice. His name is great and greatly to be praised. How great is our God is our call to worship. Let's stay as we sing, please. <laughs> The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, it trembles at his safe, Lord. Thank you for all the people being here this morning, Lord. And I want to say a special prayer for our military, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Reed. Okay, my little buddies, come on down. Look at this group. Come on, guys. Well, it's supposed to hurt coming to Children's Church, Kyle, Luke. Come on, Slowpoke Wyatt. Uh-oh, she's coming. <laughs> you got to come get a banana. Come on. Oh. <laughs> I changed his tune, didn't it? All right. Does anybody in this group get an allowance? Does your mom or daddy give you any money? When you get a little older, you're probably a little young to do that. You don't want any money? Well, you need to come, not come to my house then because I want money. Okay, we're going to pretend that this is what your mom and daddy give you every week as your allowance, as your allowance okay? Who owns this banana? Whose banana is this? Miss Lawanda's? Yes. It's God's banana. Now, God owns everything that we have. He owns everything. But you know what? He says he's going to give us this banana and he only wants one little bit of it. You know what he says? One ten. That's one dollar out of every ten dollar bills, or one penny out of every dollar. It's not asking much, is it? Okay, so God's going to give us this banana this afternoon when we're going to go home. Okay, in the morning, you're going to get up and you're going to get this banana and you're going to say, hmm, I need some of this banana. We're having a book fair at school. <coughs> So I need to buy a book. 
I, I know everything, Maggie. When are you going to learn that? <laughs> I'm talking about food in my mouth. Oh, I'm being corrected now. Okay, so we take some of our bananas, some of our money, and we buy a book. The next day, it's come snack time, we want a candy bar. You know, we've got to have some food. Well, <laughs> always does that. Some more of our money's gone. You're broke. I'm broke. What else is new? The next day, a friend needs to borrow some money. So we're going to give her a do- one of our dollars. The next day, you get to pay a dollar to wear regular clothes to school. <laughs> We get to do that sometime. The next day, we're going to buy something special for lunch. The next day, a friend asks us to go to the movies, and who can go to the movies without popcorn? Nobody. So what did we leave for God? Nothing. A banana peel. We left nothing for God. What should have been the first thing that we did when we got our money or our banana? First thing we're supposed to do is to give God's portion back to him, which is one dollar out of every ten or one penny out of every dollar. Now, he lets us keep 99 cents, but he only asks for one penny. Is that asking for very much? He doesn't want a banana peel. He wants his part of the banana or our money. So this week, when you're eating, your, or this afternoon, whenever you're eating your banana, you remember to give God his portion. When? First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. When do we give God his portion? First. First. And this is just the same with the adults. When the adults get paid their monthly thing, their money, God's tithe should be the first thing that they do. Not the rent, not the electricity, not the groceries. Because you know what? God's going to provide. He's going to make sure that all that's taken care of if we obey God and his commandments. Okay? All right, Luke, Lucy, can you hand me the mic? Luke's going to pray for us today. Your turn next week, Tommy. Where's, oh, there he is. Dear God, thank you for this day. We just hope that we are safe from you, and we just hope that we are safe, and we just hope that the people that are sick are safe. I hope that everybody is safe, and we just hope that when we go somewhere, you're with us. Amen. Good job. Amen. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every color, every race, all are covered by his grace. Jesus loves the little children of the Name above all name, worthy of all praise. He's worthy of our worship. Let's stay as we sing, please. Worthy of worship. Worthy of worship.
we pray our heavenly father we just thank you for another day that you've created for us full of blessings we thank you for all that you do for us each and every day lord and it is our continued prayer that we not take these blessings for granted that you would give us the wisdom to always know that these blessings do indeed come from you and we thank you for this country that we live in although with its problems we think it's still the greatest country on earth, Lord. We just ask you to help each one of us do our part to turn this country around and back toward the direction that it was founded upon. We just pray for our leaders. We pray that they'll start making decisions based on your word and not on their beliefs. We ask you as a church to continue to be with us Help us to be concerned about the needs of our neighbors, whether near or far. We pray that you'd always give us a vision to win the lost of this world 
to Jesus Christ. Help us to continue to do this through prayer and financial support. And Lord, we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus in an old country chapel surrounded by people who believe what that preacher man was preaching from an old worn out Bible that brought hope to all who receive so clear and simple without any questions making right and wrong easy to see now some say we were mistaken what the manuscript was saying yet that written word of god is still clear to me it's still clear to me i can't find gray it's all black white and red the scripture is the same it still says what it did then from the prophets of old who were called and spirit filled gave us that living word that was given to them some lost their lives and blood was shed if they wouldn't bow and wouldn't give in for that old black white and red I'm not seeking a new way that seems right in these days. I choose to stay with what got me here. It's given light to my darkness and to the path I travel, changing my uncertain steps to clear. You know I love the plain and simple answers to my questions, making right and wrong easy to see. I'm not looking for any changing what the Word of God is saying. That old ancient Bible still works for me. It's still working for me. No, I can't find grace. It's all black, white, and red. The scripture is the same. It still says what it did then from the prophets of old who were called and spirit filled. Gave us that living word that was given to them. Some lost their lives and blood was shed. Yet they didn't bow or didn't give in For that old black, white, and red What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Some lost their lives and blood was shed, yet they wouldn't bow or wouldn't give in for that old black, white, and red. That old black, white, and red. That old black, white, and red. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rodney, for that, uh, that song this morning. Good to see you in God's house. Good to be here. 
Uh, you probably need to take one of these bulletins, maybe a couple of them home. Really, there's so many things going on. If you don't put some of those on your calendar or tape one of those on your refrigerator, you're going to miss something here. Uh, man, Brother Austin had it plate loaded this morning trying to get through all those activities. So this is a busy time, a great time, beautiful weather. Get a little rain perhaps this week, hopefully. I know you're praying about that as well. We began talking on um, Wednesday evening about um, a challenge from our state convention. For 21 days prior to the election, we've been challenged to pray and to pray for our nation, pray for America for 21 days. I hope that you are doing that seriously. I hope that you are reading these devotionals day by day. Most of them are just a page, if not much more. A short passage of scripture to direct your thinking and then to have a time of prayer prior to November the 8th. Perhaps the most pivotal election in our nation's history. And I'll not have to say much more about that because most of you watch enough news. You don't have to watch very long to look and see. But I said something to you in my message Wednesday evening that is um, intriguing to me in some respects and um, a little bit more than that in, in other respects. And that's kind of what I want to talk about this morning. I, I thought if, if I was going to preach a sermon that even mentioned fasting, I might better, like Brother Austin said, better repent before you go to the judgment house. If I'm going to preach about fasting, I need to do it before the holidays. Amen? You know, because I, I don't think I can get too many takers after uh, another couple of weeks here. I want you to turn with you to the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 17 gives to us the basis for our thinking here. I want us to read together this very interesting story in Matthew chapter 17 in, in just a moment. And um, we'll look at this passage beginning in our reading perhaps in about verse 14. In the field of literature there are numerous devices, literary scholars call them. Sometimes they're called idioms. Sometimes they're called hyperbole. But no matter what you call it, they're used to describe things. One is used to describe a, a patently obvious, maybe sometimes an embarrassing or somewhat we would call an awkward situation. Such is the case with a phrase that you know well, and we've all used from time to time to describe one of these obvious, awkward, embarrassing situations. And we say, well, that's the elephant in the room, don't we? In the early 1800s, a poet named Erwin Kryloff wrote a fable entitled The Inquisitive Man. And Irvin Kryloff, in that fable, wrote about a, a, a character of his in his poem. And the man went to visit a museum. And there in the museum, he studied small things, little museum pieces, little things. And the fable goes on to recount how after his visit to the museum, he knew all about all of these little things, but had totally missed an elephant that was in the room. Famed Russian author Dostoevsky, in his novel entitled Demons, said this of his character named Belinsky. He said, Belinsky was just like Krylov's inquisitive man. He failed to notice the elephant in the room at the museum. I don't know where that phrase came from. And neither does anybody else for sure. Maybe it came from Krylov. Maybe it came from Dostoevsky. Maybe, as some report in literature circles, that it came from the New York Times in the 1950s. I rather doubt that. But that's where some attribute it to 
Truth be told, disagreement abounds with literary historians, and no one knows for sure, but we all know what we say when we say that's the elephant in the room, don't we? We know what it means. I think, perhaps, in like fashion, Jesus was trying to teach us a lesson here about prayer. And I entitled this message, Unbelief and Faith and Fasting. And maybe I should have titled it differently. Maybe I should have entitled it Failure, Faith, and Fasting. For Jesus talks about all of these in his instructions to the disciples in the passage that we're going to read. Now, now many, most of you probably, are just like I am. You've been a member of a church for a long, long time. Some of you may have been brought up in a different denomination. Maybe you were raised a Methodist and then became a part of a Baptist church. I don't know. Some of you have been Southern Baptists like I've been as far back as you can remember. You've been to RAs and GAs and Sunday school and training union, and you've been to revivals and prayer meetings and WMU and now WOM and prayer circles and all kinds of other special services. But I want to ask you, how many of you, how many of you have ever read a book? How many of you have ever heard a sermon or even a Sunday school lesson about fasting? Don't answer that question. I already know the answer. I've been preaching for over 35 years, and I've never preached one sermon, not one, about fasting. Maybe, maybe. It's the elephant in the room. Maybe it's been there all along. And you and I have all missed it. But how often, just look, how often does the scripture link prayer and fasting? Prayer and fasting. I want you to note in this interesting story. Now let me preface the reading of this passage, Matthew chapter 17, details what we call the, the encounter of the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus went up on the mountain for a period of time with Peter, James, and John. They had a, they had a blockbuster experience there. It was, a, it was quite an unusual thing. Jesus was transfigured, whatever exactly that means, and no one really knows for sure, but he was changed in that moment. His face began to glow, and even his clothing began to glow, and strange things happened in Matthew chapter 17 on that mountain with Jesus and those three disciples. The scripture says that uh, Elijah and Moses appeared and they were talking with God. Now, if you want uh, some, some basis for your thinking about what heaven is going to be like, whether we will really know one another, we will really have faculties such as we have here, here's some pretty good starting point for you right here. <laughs> they appeared, they were visible, they were able to be seen and they were talking, vis it was audible so that they could be heard, they were talking to God and suddenly, God appeared in a cloud on that mountain, and the disciples passed out. <laughs> they just couldn't take any more. That was it. They hit the ground, fell out cold. Jesus revived them, and they started down the mountainside. They had been on the pinnacle. They had been at the height of glory. It was so great up there, Peter says, Lord, let's just stay here. I'll build three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and, and one for Elijah. Let's just stay up here forever. That's the way it is. It, we want to stay on the mountaintop all the time, but that's, that's not where we as Christians live oftentimes. Oh, there's a valley below. They left the pinnacle of that mountain and descended to the reality of life below. Perfect glory and perfect problems down 
in the valley. And we pick up the story right here of pressing need. Matthew 17, 14 says, when they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt down before him, Jesus. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son. Because he has seizures and suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. Note verse 16 carefully. I brought him to your disciples. But they couldn't heal him. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and rebellious generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me here. And then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And from that moment, the boy was healed. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? Lord, why couldn't we do that? Jesus answered in verse 20, Because of your little faith, he told them. For I assure you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. Note what we see here. In the one hand, there is a group of devastated disciples. Matthew chapter 10 says, Jesus himself had given them authority. He had given them power to cast out demons and unclean spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. What happened? Devastated. Disciples. It was also a desperate father. A desperate father. This man caught them before they ever got down off of the mountainside. Lord, Lord, do something for my son. They were standing all around in this crowd. Some devouring scribes too. Guess what they were doing in the midst of the problem that was at hand? They were eating one another up. They were arguing and fussing and fighting. These guys are nothing. They can't do anything. They don't have any power. They don't know anything about what to do. They failed. Look at them. And on and on and on. Sort of reminds me of the world that we live in today. Mm. And then notice the sinner should have been the center of attention. This deranged, maybe dying boy, the son of this man. I want you to note some things in this story quickly. First of all, Note the problem at hand. The problem that was at hand. The father is distraught. He is desperate. Medical care in that day was, was nothing. It, it was absolutely zero compared to what you and I know. I mean, with the best in the world, they had probably the worst that there's ever been. Medical experts reading this have said, according to the language here, this boy had seizures. The scripture says he suffered terribly. He suffered severely. Most medical experts believe that verse 15 there says he was, 
he was really seriously ill, probably from some severe form of epilepsy, a, a disease that can go from, from a minor seizure every once in a while to a really sick child like this that was having seizures that were, that were unbelievable. Did you notice he was suicidal? Not intentionally suicidal, but he seizured so badly, so severely that at times he fell into the fire and they had to rescue him. He fell into the water and they rescued him in the midst of a seizure. Falling into the water could be fatal in, in just a matter of moments. He, he was suicidal whether he intended, he didn't intend to, but he couldn't help himself. He suffered Severely, John Mark in, in his book says he was mute. He, he was unable to speak, so he couldn't tell them anything. He could only make sounds, make noises. And, and in his gospel, Mark says he would fall to the ground and, and he gritted his teeth. He bruxed, we say in the dental world. He ground his teeth so much like a, like a mule eating corn. We say, you know what that sound is? That boy could grind his teeth that way when he fell to the ground in one of those convulsions. He was grinding his teeth so much that if you were standing nearby, you could audibly hear him making noise, grinding his teeth together. He was going to take his own life. The scripture says they thought at times he was going to die because he foamed at the mouth when he fell onto the ground. They didn't have a clue what to do. Dr. Luke, the physician, records additionally that he screamed and he wailed as he seizures. Do you imagine that, that some of the folks around were scared to death? I suppose, I, I, if you've never seen anybody have a, a grand mal seizure like that, it'll scare you to death. And I expect they were. Luke also says this was this man's only son. The family name was at stake. Now, Matthew didn't record this, but, but Mark does. That, that he brought them first to the disciples. But he told Jesus they couldn't help him. His only son devastated the disciples, the desperate father that we see, the devouring scribes who were saying, they can't do anything. They don't know what to do either. And this son who was dying, do you think just by chance that there may have been an elephant in the room? Somebody missed Something, something was lacking. Matthew and Luke both record in their language that Jesus, by the way he spoke here, was grieved. He was grieved in his spirit. Look again at verse 17. You unbelieving and rebellious generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? You also in Luke chapter 9. The problem was very evident at hand. But the second thing I want you to see is power from on high. Jesus said, bring him to me. Bring him to me. In verse 17 that we read there, he said, bring him to me. And, and the scripture says he did a, a number of things in order. He, he first of all, First of all, denounce those disciples, unbelievers, failure, failure, unbelievers. How long must I put up with you? What he literally said, I'm not going to be here forever. You need to find out what the elephant in the room is all about. He denounced his disciples. But then he got right to the heart of the matter and he denounced the demon. He denounced the demon that was in the boy. He rebuked that demon. And he says to him, in essence here, reading between the lines with the language that is used, leave him and don't ever come back. Go out of him and don't bother him again ever. No more sickness. No more problems. And he delivered 
that boy. In a moment, in an instant, in verse 18, it came out of him. Luke says he was convulsing on the ground because as he went toward Jesus, he went into another seizure and fell out on the ground convulsing and seizing and wailing and gritting his teeth so loud that everyone can hear. And Jesus got to him there on the ground in the midst of that seizure and rebuked that demon. And in a moment, in an instant, that boy was healed. Matthew 18 says it was dramatic healing. What no one else could do, Jesus did instantly. And he picked him up. And delivered him back to his distraught dad. He was completely whole. Wasn't a process. Wasn't a, wasn't a course of treatment. There's a picture there. That's what salvation is like. Jesus said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved in a moment, in an instant, right now, immediately. That unclean spirit obey him. That's, that's the way salvation is. Justification is, is momentary, instantaneous. It's right now. Sanctification goes on for a long time. Glorification is something we get later on. But salvation is just like that. That's what Jesus does. That's how he works and on the authority of a tax collector and a physician that's exactly what happened that day power from on high thirdly I want you to see note the priority of those that were helpless here look at verse 19 after all this was over it didn't take long it was quick <laughs> This boy had been doing this as long as he'd been alive, scaring everybody to death. The disciples went to Jesus in verse 19, Lord, scratching their head. Why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we drive the demon out? Now, you know, I got to thinking in my twisted mind. I got to wondering, how did they go about that? What did they do? You know what I think? I think when, when that man came to them, Jesus was still up on the mountain, you know. I think when he came to them, one arrogant soul and this nine who were left down below, said, y'all go on, I got this. I'll handle it by himself. And whatever he did, I don't know if he laid hands on him. I don't know if he just prayed for him and said, bring him here. Y'all go ahead, I got this. But he prayed, no doubt, for that boy. And nothing happened. He had another seizure, maybe right there. The guy said, something got to change. He called his buddy, the other disciple. I don't know who was who. Nobody tells us that. He said, hey, we got a problem. Come help me. Two of them. They prayed. Maybe they laid hands on. Nothing happened. Three, same process, same result. Nothing happened. Boy had another seizure. He's getting worse. And, and maybe finally they called a whole group together, the other nine. They said, let's, let's make a circle. I don't think they did that because I'm going to tell you, I think they were so scared of that kid and that terrible nature of that seizure and that wailing and gritting of his teeth and falling out on the ground and foaming at the mouth. They thought he was going to die in their presence and they didn't want to get across the room from him. They said, you just stay over there. We're going to go over here and pray. I think that's what they did. I really do. I think nine of them got together in a group over there. And they said, we'll handle this from over here. We don't have to touch him. And nothing worked. They found themselves in the midst of a real crisis. And nothing worked. They were feckless 
and helpless and powerless to do anything. And they said, Lord, Lord, why couldn't we do what you did? You remember when the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him to pray and he instructed him and and that he gave to them what we call the Lord's Prayer, which is a, really a misnomer. That's not the Lord's Prayer. But he instructed them in prayer because, you know what, they really asked them. They said, Lord, teach us to pray like you prayed. Lord, why couldn't we drive it out like you did? What happened? What's the difference? What else could he say? It was the elephant in the room. Jesus said in verse 20, because of your little faith, your unbelief, your failure, Because he said, I assure you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, I don't have to describe that to any of you. You can say to this mountain, mountain, move from here over there. And it'll happen. Nothing is impossible for you. And Jesus no doubt anticipated their next question in verse 20 the last part of it in verse 21 they said where 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 does this mountain moving kind of faith come from lord now verse 21 is problematic some of you are going to hit me up i know this is coming because you're going to say, hey, Brother Vic, I don't know what kind of Bible you're reading, but verse 21 is not in mine. And some might be right, because it's not. It's not in some translations, because, we need to talk about this in a minute, because it is not in some early manuscripts. And some just disregarded it. It is in some of the very oldest and some of the very best manuscripts, the oldest and best text. Some believe that perhaps this phrase was added by a copyist or a scribe or a translator at some point, perhaps. If you look in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 29, the parallel verse to this, it is in Mark's gospel, and it does exist in all of the early manuscripts of Mark's gospel. So it cannot just be disregarded, even though it may not specifically appear here. It is a valid statement. Jesus is simply illustrating to them something in this parallel verse here. Maybe the scribe or the copyist or the translator thought that it for, uh, for illustrative reason, for idiomatic reasons, to illustrate the elephant in the room, if you will, to all of us, added it in here. It is because of that widespread traditionally accepted by the early church and the later church as well. But the circumstances here are unchanged. They are the same. The disciples, we know because of what it says in, in Matthew chapter 9, that in Matthew chapter 17, the disciples did not fast. They had not been fasting. Maybe Jesus is illustrating to him something that they needed to know because on that time that he was on the mountain with the three disciples there, maybe they had grown weak because they hadn't been praying. Maybe they hadn't been fasting. We know they hadn't been fasting and maybe their faith had weakened during this self-indulgent 
time. They should have been more disciplined in these days. Maybe they would have been able to have meet the needs of this boy. Maybe like Samson in the book of Judges in the Old Testament, their power was gone and they didn't realize it until it was too late. Jesus is illustrating to them here a principle, I think, Jesus is saying to them that some demons, some spirits are more malignant than others. And they require more discipline. They require more, uh, more time spent, more prayer. And maybe they even require something that calls upon the power of God like fasting for a certain situation. Because some spirits are more destructive than others. Jesus said this kind, nothing else that he could have been referring to except this boy and this spirit that possessed him. This kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. So forth and finally, you see the problem at hand the power that came from on high through our Lord Christ, the priority of these helpless disciples. Well, Lord, why couldn't we do that? Fourth and finally, look at the principle of the story. Jesus, I think, may be clearly addressing in idiomatic fashion the elephant in the room here. Jesus, I think, is talking about faith, first of all. Do you know what faith needs to give it life it needs a life of prayer it needs a life of prayer it needs a heart of prayer faith is born in prayer faith is ignited in prayer faith is strengthened in prayer faith is developed in prayer it is accentuated in prayer jesus said this kind and he could not have been talking about anything else how big is our problem how big is your problem how big is that for which we are praying these 21 days it's pretty big we better pray like we've never prayed before and we might ought to really consider fasting now in a in a way this has sort of been a teaser because i knew i was going to run out of time this morning I want to talk about fasting, and I'm going to have to delay that to next week, so you're going to have to come back for the second part of this. But let me tell you, just to get you started and to get you looking and thinking, because that's really what I need to do. I can't just feed you everything. You have to study and think and let God speak to you and read his word and look at what it says here. Fasting, I submit to you, strengthens our prayer. And we're going to talk about that next week. Fasting supports our prayer. It stimulates our prayer. I think Jesus was teaching them a lesson here. And I think he would say to us here, there is something I need to say to you about living in moderation. Live in moderation. Learn temperance and practice temperance in that which you do. Loosen the hold of the flesh on your life because it grasps for every one of us. I think Jesus says to us, look for the spiritual, not for the temporal, and leave the desires of the flesh to separate. Maybe it's from food. Maybe it's from other things. But fasting to us as Southern Baptists may just be the elephant in the room. And we need to talk about it. I hope you'll be here next week. And we'll go further into what it is and what it's all about and what we need to do. In the meantime, I hope you'll pray like you've never prayed before. Would you pray with me right now? Father, thank you for this precious time. Thank you for your word that speaks, for the clarion calls that it issues to us, and for this call that has been issued for prayer and fasting for these 21 days prior to this pivotal election in these perilous days in which our nation finds itself. 
for a world that has gone crazy and is turned upside down, for leaders who would usurp power and take from one and uh, integrate into their own. Oh, Father, deliver us from ourselves today. How we pray that we might be serious on our face before you in these upcoming days. And we know that you'll hear. We know that you'll answer from heaven. We know that when we are serious before you, that things of eternal significance can happen. They did here when Jesus called upon deliverance for this boy. We need deliverance of that kind instantaneously in a moment in our nation today. Bless, we pray. Bless us as we pray and as we fast and as we come apart and separate ourselves for a time before you. Bless us. Bless our church and bless our nation. Just now, if there's one here who knows you not in the free pardon and forgiveness of sin, how we pray that that soul might be strangely warmed by the movement of your spirit as you call out to them and that they might be saved. Perhaps there's some who would come today on transfer letter in any other way that we receive members by statement from a church of like faith and order. Maybe there's someone would come in an act of rededication and renewal. This is your invitation. You be honored by the decisions that we register publicly today. We just pray that this will be a high and holy time as we open the doors of the church just now. We pray it all in the matchless name of Christ. Stand quietly to your feet and as you